All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ken Goldberg. I'm a professor in the College of Engineering, School of Information, and Art Practice Department here on campus, and it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. We are, in fact, another thing I would like to um, mention is that we are, there's work going on behind the scenes on a new initiative in uh, Citrus. It's all a bit hush-hush right now, so I can't give you all the details, but um, it is relevant to today's talk and you can use your imaginations, that will be announced on the 22nd of April. So please stay tuned. And if you want to find out more information specifically about this, please contact me, goldberg at berkeley.edu. So I want to welcome everyone here, also everyone on the web um, and from the other campuses. And mention that tomorrow at 1 o'clock in uh, 240 Bechtel, there's going to be a lecture in a new series called Resilience Research Seminars. And this is jointly being organized by ITS, the Institute of Transportation Studies, and TRUST, our research institute on, um, on security. And this is, uh, the talk will be called Machine Learning Under Attack by Eugene Vorobechik from Vanderbilt. So again, that's uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. in 240 Bechtel. I also want you to save the date if possible. There's going to be a hack for Congress, um, multi-city hackathon to address issues of congressional gridlock. That's going to be on May, March 21st and 22nd. We're co-sponsoring this. It's going to be at a Code for America event in San Francisco, and you can find out more on our website. So for today's speaker is a, a very esteemed colleague who comes to us from UC Davis, uh, Sturgio, Stavros uh, Vujiakas, is, um, is an assistant professor of agricultural, and auto, uh, agricultural robotics and automation at Davis. He has a background and did his PhD at RPI in robotics, he has a, where he studied under a Fulbright Fellowship. And then he joined the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at Davis in 2012. He's, um, he, after spending time as a faculty member at Aristotle University in Greece. So we're happy to have him back here in, the, uh, in California, where he's working in a topic that's extremely relevant for, for, for our state and, um, and, and for all of us who enjoy eating on occasion. Um, so please welcome Stavros. Um, thank you very much, Ken, for the introduction, and thank you for the uh, invitation to come and talk to you. Uh, I'm really delighted. I think the last time I was in Berkeley was in 1994, as I told you. It's been a long time, so I'm really glad to be back. Um, this, this talk today will be, um, I would say, not a very uh, uh, technical talk in the sense that you won't see any equations, although you can ask anything about equations. Uh, it's, it, the, the goal is to you know, present some problems and challenges that we face uh, in agriculture and more specifically in uh, harvesting for agricultural crops and then also show some of the work that we are doing at Davis to address those uh, problems. So uh, agriculture is, is really trendy these days. I mean it always was but now it's even more because of the huge challenges in uh, population increase. Uh, 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 the, the prediction is 9 billion by 2050. Essentially what that means is that we need to produce much more and get that to the, uh, uh, to the consumer by using less, less inputs. Inputs meaning chemicals, water, soil, energy, you name it. So this is, this is a big challenge and of course it's a very wide uh, uh, topic. My uh, particular interests are in uh, harvesting. So today's talk will focus on harvesting of agricultural crops and it really depends on what kind of crops we are talking about you know, uh, when we uh, say we are harvesting those crops. In, uh, in general, we can, car we can uh, characterize crops or divide them in two different categories. We have our field crops, which is your, your, your usual uh, uh, corn and soybean, uh, huge fields, very homogeneous crop. And then we also have specialty crops, which is everything else. And if you, if you think about you know, grain, if you think about corn and how we harvest those crops, this is, this is something you would see. Highly mechanized harvesting processes, automated machinery, uh, this is really state of the art, 
And a lot of the research now is being done by the companies themselves, the John Deere's and the CNA's of the world, because a lot of that uh, uh, technology is really applied by now. Now, this is something that came out very recently, and it, it looks the same as the previous picture, but here there's a big difference. These are autonomous machines. We now have the possibility, uh, because of uh, GIS and uh, GPS technology, and you know, all the underlying sensing and control technology, not only to uh, auto-steer a harvester, but that harvester can act as a master for a slave, an unloading truck, and that slave can actually follow the harvester in the field, because if you think about it, the harvester costs maybe a million dollars and has a huge throughput, it's harvesting a lot of material, and you, you know, the tank is getting full, you need to empty that tank regularly, so there's a, there's a whole issue of logistics in the field, and the state of the art now is that we have commercial systems where all of this coordination in the field is starting to happen uh, autonomously. Now, let's go to specialty crops, and specialty crops is, you know, is your grapes, is your tomatoes, is your fruits, your vegetables, your flowers, and the first thing you notice about, about uh, specialty crops is that they are very diverse. They're not really homogeneous. They're, they take many different forms. They can be under the ground, over the ground. So what does harvesting look like for specialty crops? This is the good case. This is grape harvesting. And you see a grape harvester. This is you know, a machine you can buy off the shelf. It, it, it's kind of simple. It, it uses an, an actuating mechanism to vibrate the vines so the, uh, the grapes fall and then it collects them and processes them, those grapes are going to become wine or juice. They are not meant to be eaten uh, uh, on our tables. Any, any idea why? It's rather obvious, right? If you, if you hit them, they don't look good and actually they will rotten before you eat them. Uh, this is, and it's not a commercial for this company, it's just that I didn't have the time to remove the first part. This is citrus harvesting. These are huge, big machines that have those branch shaking mechanisms. So they go to the right and to the left of the tree, they squeeze it, they shake it, all the fruit drops down, and again, those fruits will turn into juice. They will not end up on our tables exactly because they are beaten while they're being harvested. So what we see here are two cases where the specialty crops that we harvest and they are to be processed, we really have mechanization automation for those crops. However, uh, the story changes radically when we talk about fresh market crops. Think about your apples, your peaches, your nectarines, anything we consume on the table. This is how we do it. Manual. People climb on ladders, they have bags, they fill them up with the fruit, then they walk over to a bin, they empty it, and they keep doing this eight hours a day. It can get pretty hot in an orchard in California, I, I, I can testify to that. And it can be pretty cold in the morning at 5 a.m. when those guys start to work. So you see a huge difference here. I, I see that difference, everybody sees that difference. Look at that extreme. These guys are harvesting strawberries. Why are they running? Any idea? Speed? Yeah? As much as possible. They are paid piece rate. The more they gather, the more money they make, at least at the top of the season. So this is something you wouldn't really like to do. People have tried to do it, like, you know, uh, people who are not in this field, it can, you know, it can kill you. It's very difficult. It's very, uh, uh, very strange work. So this is where we are now. This is the state of the art when it comes to uh, specialty crops for the fresh market. Mechanization and automation lag a lot. It's a different universe. There are different reasons for that. There are, of course, the technical problems and the technical issues that relate to fresh market harvesting. The fruits must be harvested gently. You will not buy a, a, a fruit with a bruise at the supermarket. We, get, we tend to select the better ones or in America, the biggest ones, but you know, the shiniest. So we want good fruit. Also, they need to be picked selectively very often because some of them are mature and ripe, some are not. And also, they need to be harvested very, very quickly. 
So can you imagine a machine that is very gentle and extremely quick? It's, it's a challenge. It's not an easy problem. And I will mention other technical problems too. But there's also economics involved. There is a huge variety of crops. Harvesting a lettuce or a lemon or a strawberry would require a totally different approach and a different machine. And that fragmentation discourages private investment. And the other issue is that until recently, labor has been cheap and abundant. But this has changed radically. Growers face huge labor problems. I was having a conversation before. The machines that we dream of building will not take jobs away. Those jobs are not there. People prefer to work in other industries rather than working in the field. And that's why growers cannot find workers. They don't plant as much as they would like, or very often they will lose crops because they will go and harvest it. And there is also other reasons. Uh, a few decades back, after the tomato harvester was invented at UC Davis, thousands of workers lost their jobs, at least temporarily uh, working on the fields. There was a huge issue, and then the, uh, the approach by the state and the federal government was that we are not funding mechanization research because it's taking jobs away. So although we had technical problems, there was no funding to overcome them, overcome them in the last you know, 30 to 40 years. Now, what can we do to harvest fresh market crops? Well, there are different alternatives. One is to use harvest aids. Recognize the, fa the fact that our machines are not good enough to harvest fruit and vegetables, so we will use people, but we'll make it easier on them. We, we will make it faster. We will increase the efficiency. This is an orchard platform. Uh, this is strawberry harvesting. Again, instead of walking back and forth, the workers just deposit their uh, harvested crop on the conveyor. The conveyor moves. So it, it, it helps out with, with efficiency. So this is one approach. It's, it's what I call the intermediate approach to full mechanization. Help the people do the job better. Uh, the holy grail of, of uh, harvesting for fresh market crops is, of course, robots. This is interesting. This is, uh, it, it comes out of a uh, publication from 2012. It's a, uh, a robot built in China. Uh, I will show that again a few slides uh, afterwards. And it, it's meant to harvest apples. Uh, and for very obvious reasons, it's not really commercial yet. One is that it takes quite several seconds to harvest one apple, uh, where a typical worker will harvest two to three apples per second. Now, technical challenges. Can we achieve those robots? Can we build them? Well, we have, first of all, technical challenges at the fruit level. It's very difficult for a vision system or a sensing system to detect fruits in canopies because of occlusion issues, because of, of, of the color that may be very close to the, uh, to the foliage. So we have an issue of vision and perception. And I'm not saying that you know, we can't do it. But if you can detect only 70% of the fruit, then the 30% of the fruit will not be harvested. So it's, it's a matter of you know, improving the technology here. It's a huge problem. The other issue is grasping and actually uh, getting access to the fruit, detaching it, and removing it. That technology is not there yet, at least at the speeds that we, we want. And also, uh, you know, how do you do your visual surveying and navigation, uh, avoiding branches, doing all of that in a natural setting inside a canopy? It's really very difficult. And remember, again, we are talking large speeds. So, uh, but that, that's at the fruit level. We have other issues which are more of design issues. Somehow, the machine and the orchard need to be compatible. What that means is that if you have a machine that has certain kinematics, for example, imagine of, of, a, of a robot arm or a hundred of them on a platform, they should be able to reach 100% of the fruits in the canopies, or maybe 98. So it's a problem of you know, how the design of your machine matches the design, the architecture of your orchards. This, this, this problem has not been really studied, but we need to maximize fruit reachability, minimize dead times when we are picking fruits uh, selectively, and also minimize all related times to travel from fruit to fruit, from tree to tree. So all of this is an efficiency issue. And efficiency really depends on the tree training system, on the distribution of the fruits, the layout of the orchard, but it also depends on your machine. So 
you know, breeders design plants and orchards and, and growers. We design the machines, but somehow we should work together to get a, a working system. So what you will see is that when we talk about robotics, we refer more to uh, machines that can work in uncertain and unstructured environments. We stress a lot, you know, perception and dexterity. On the other hand, when we talk about automation, you know, in, in, a, in a car factory, for example, we stress high throughput, repeatability, quality. Uh, the environment is perfectly structured and known. Well, when we talk about agricultural robotics, we really want both worlds. We want uh, the dexterity and the gentleness of robots and the flexibility of robots and the high throughput of, of, of manufacturing equipment. And that's very challenging. That, of course, needs to come at a relatively low cost. We are not building Teslas, we are harvesting uh, fruits. So something that we are uh, pursuing in order to, to address these issues is think in terms of automation and manufacturing more than rather in terms of of uh, uh, robotics itself, and and take take the part uh, the analogy where your harvester, be it a person or a machine, is really like a a robot that is doing you know the assembly work, it's doing the the welding, it's doing the uh, the major operation, and then at that factory you will have a material transportation system. It could be conveyors, AGVs. And that material transport system is also necessary and present in the field. So you can think of this analogy, harvesting in the field, you have a combine harvester uh, working in a, in a manufacturing plant, you have your robot. And then in the field, you have a transportation system to transport the fruits and the crops. And in the factory, you have a similar system to do material transportation. So we would like to exploit this, this type of paradigm and thinking and see how we can improve uh, on, uh, on agricultural robotics and automation for specialty crop harvesting. So I will uh, describe a couple of projects. One is the, uh, we call it Freibolts. It's, it basically attacks the following issue. When we do manual harvesting, a lot of our time, 20 to 30% is spent just on walking and delivering the produce. Also, that task is dangerous. You know, the, the soil really is wet so we can sleep. We have ergonomics related problems. What can we do to improve that? And again, following the previous paradigm, you can think of your worker as the machine, the robot doing the intelligent part of the task, and you can think of another machine that could be doing the more you know, uh, mundane or stupid part of the task, which is just, just transporting goods in the field. And this was the idea behind this project that got uh, funded through the National Robotics Initiative. And then uh, you know, this is just some preliminary, preliminary work that we are doing where we are instrumenting the pickers and trying to model the task that they're doing. Because a main task, a main challenge with this type of work is that you can use machinery to increase the efficiency of the workers. But if you aim for 100% efficiency, that's not good for them. Because when they are not efficient, that means that they're resting, they're moving, they're walking. So you don't really want to maximize the efficiency. You want to incorporate constraints that relate to ergonomic variables uh, that you are trying to monitor while they're working. So this project is about building uh, wearable sensors that we can use to monitor the, the workers and you know how fast they're picking, but also how much they have been working. And then we, we do uh, dispatching of our robot fleet on the field based not only on the, uh, on the efficiency, but also on the ergonomic status of the people. Uh, another, another project that we are working on is what we call model-based design. And the idea is the following. You know, if you go to growers, they will ask you, these are our trees. They're big, 15 feet high. Can you build machines for us to harvest those trees? And you, know, you never say no because you don't get any funding, but you don't say yes because you can't really do it right now. What you can say is that, well, why don't you change your orchard to make it more structured, like a factory maybe, decrease the uncertainty, and then I will make machines for you because it's going to be much easier. Well, their next question is, OK, let me, let me do that. Well, it takes a lot of money and, and time to, re, to rebuild or replant an orchard. Should we prefer this architecture or that architecture? 
or would it make a difference? How much of a difference would it make for the machine that you will build? And unfortunately, we don't have the answer for that either. So if you, were, if you, if you ask a manufacturing you know, uh, engineer and automation guy to, to design and build a new manufacturing line, the first step would be to model it using existing tools. And the second step would be to actually buy, integrate the machinery, uh, the equipment, and then uh, implement the line. Well, in agricultural engineering, our problem is that we go directly to step number two. We just build, try it. If it doesn't work well, we try to, to improve it. And that has led to problems. I like to show this picture. These are two orchard harvesting platforms. These are harvest aids. And you know, if I were to ask you, can you guess the decade that was built in and the decade that was built in, could you give me any answers or guesses? What about this? Decade? Century? <laughs> 1940s? Yeah, OK, well. Yeah, it looks old, right? What about this? 80s? 70s? It's really difficult to tell the difference, right? Well, the truth is that this picture is colored, but I removed the color to make it difficult on you. But they are 40 years apart. We haven't gone very far in those 40 years. This is the same for lettuce harvesting, the same exactly 50 years of difference. So what is the problem? Here is another example. The first robot to pick citrus, 1985, 2012. They changed the, you know, some of the components and technology. The design and the approach hasn't really changed drastically. And one problem uh, you know, what we have is that our development cycle is what I show here. We, we design a platform and then we physically build it. Then we experiment in the field and try to evaluate and iterate on this. However, the problem with this cycle is that, it, it, it's, that it's costly and slow, and then you run out of money. Now, the other problem is that once you evaluate your machine in the field, you cannot transfer your results to variations of this machine. So you cannot use it as, an, as a gradient for an optimization procedure. It's, it doesn't really apply. But also, you can't really apply those results to different orchard architectures. So what we lack is tools to do model-based design. We would like to stop building immediately, but do a model-based approach where we can design our machinery and evaluate it in virtual orchards first, and then after some iterations, uh, build the machine and test it in actual orchards. The, the, the beauty of this approach is that you can redesign your orchard too, or you can create a hypothetical tree and see that if it's better, you can ask your breeder to, uh, to breed that tree for you. So it, it's a systems approach. You, it, it enables you to, to, to design on both ends. How can you do that? It's not difficult to find you know, simulators to do the mechanics, the dynamics, incorporate the models. What was lacking was data and models regarding trees and fruits. This is what we didn't have. So we, uh, we uh, made an effort to develop a technology to map fruits in canopies. It's, it's a rather simple approach. We use four beacons, radio beacons, and we use another beacon, on a, uh, an antenna on a glove. So we, we measure the ranges of the four beacons from the antenna, and then we trilaterate. So every time we pick a fruit, we click a controller, we timestamp it, and after this is done, we come up with maps of fruits. These are three-dimensional maps. They're actually georeferenced, but I just you know, have a, a, a relative coordinate system here. And this is the Google uh, Earth image of the part of the orchard that we harvested. Now, we extended that to trees also. So we are now, even now as I'm talking, we are digitizing trees and the fruits that they have. And again, the idea is to create CAD models. And out of those models, create statistical models of trees so we could you know, ideally call a MATLAB function and say, I want 100 trees of this variety, you know, of this age, at this layout, and with a fruit distribution that matches the data I got in the field. 
Now, this is an example of you know, several trees in a row. This, this is data uh, uh, digitized last year. And then once you have that data, you can produce stuff that we never had. This is, this is like a, a probability density function of fruits in a tree, this type of tree. And if you have this information, you can start doing some analysis. So what we are doing now is we are saying, OK, uh, if you shake a tree and, and let the fruit drop, it doesn't really work for fresh market fruits because when they drop, they hit branches and they hit uh, uh, twigs, etc. Well, could we intercept the fruits by inserting something into the canopy and reduce the average drop height? Perhaps we could. Well, actually, people tried it 40 years ago and it kind of worked. So they built, they tested, they ran out of money and it stopped. What we want to do is say, well, what if we use the models that we have now to design a system and then evaluate numerically, quantitatively, how good the system is? What are the probabilities that when a fruit drops, it will hit or will not hit something on the way? And does that machine improve that probability? So this is an example where we did some preliminary testing. This is a, a tree and the fruits. And then we extended cylinders downward and calculated the probability that the fruit on its way down you know, via gravity will not hit something. And it turns out that for a 2.5 meter tree, this is the last row, 37% of the fruit will be intact. It will not hit anything. Does it say much? Well, actually, that kind of reflects reality. This is how it is. That's why nobody uses shakers. But what the promise is now is that if you insert things into here, then you could play around with these probabilities and improve the process. Another, another idea is, OK, well, you know, people are proposing to use multiple arms or arrays of actuators to pick fruit. Well, the question is, how many should you have? What, you know, how many degrees of freedom? How complex is it to gather those fruits? Configuration, why, why, you know, why, what is the efficiency of this machine? I'm not really talking about the perception or the uh, uh, grasping, because these are independent of, the, of this overall design. I'm talking about limits of efficiency and speed, because if the machine is not, uh, is not efficient enough, there is no point in actually building it. So this is something we did. We, we asked ourselves, what if you had very simple actuators? It's a telescopic arm, and it's going in and out, reaching for fruit. What would the, be the, the, you know, the efficiency of such a system? Well, it turns out that if you calculate it for the trees that we had, 72% of the fruits were reachable by only extending horizontally into the canopy. That opens up possibilities. You could build. Uh, a robot that doesn't even have perception. You could have many arms if they're cheap, and then you could be probing into the canopy and, you know, and, and getting or not getting fruits. Is that a good idea? Well, now with these models, we can try to investigate these ideas. And actually, this is a generalization of the concept we have now. Right now, we are shaking branches. You can think of those rods as very stupid actuators. They're just going in and shaking. Well, if we had a little bit smarter actuators, but simple, could we get the results that we need? So uh, what would be the, uh, the future for this approach? Well, right now, we are doing, as I said, the machine design, modeling, and, and trying to do uh, uh, the validation using their models and then, of course, building the stuff. But we also need virtual orchards, models, to do this. And how do we get them? The hard way. We digitize trees and fruits. It's, it, it takes a lot of time. It's not easy. This is a challenge. Uh, something that is coming up in the horizon, and, and people are already working on it. There is somebody working in Davis, but other groups too, is what we call functional structural plant models. You can actually create code that will uh, uh, solve all the nutrient balance equations and you will grow your tree using simulation, you know, L systems with biomechanics and, 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 and all the uh, nutritional uh, 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 equations. And by creating such models, you don't really need to digitize. Well, if those models are validated, then you could use those to, to do your, uh, your design. Then, of course, a little bit more futuristic is that people are talking about incorporating breeding and genetics into models that grow trees or plants. 
So you can think of, of an approach where the machine design and the breeding could be done uh, simultaneously and you have a way to numerically or quantitatively calculate what will be the harvesting efficiency of the system and not only of the machine. So uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really very close to the time that I had allocated for, for the talk, but I would like to end here. This was a very high level talk and I would be happy to answer high level questions or lower level questions uh, related to the technology, the, the approach. Uh, I didn't really talk much about the social issue because that's, that's very centric to, to Citrus. I only briefly uh, uh, mentioned that these approaches are not really taking jobs away. The jobs are not there. But another important issue is when we build robots to do harvest aiding or, or harvesting, how do those robots interact with people, issues of safety, issues of not really trying to push the people too much in, in, in being very efficient because that you know, worsens the ergonomics of, of the operation. These are all huge issues that need to be explored. Actually, we are trying to use this approach to do that too. So for example, we, are, you know, we would like and you know, we're trying to do that model humans, digital models, where you can populate uh, an orchard platform with a model of a person and then check whether the control laws of the platform and the kinematics and the design uh, are bad or good for the ergonomics of that person as the person is reaching out for fruit. So we could incorporate up to some degree uh, humans inside this approach uh, to see how the, uh, the machine and the human operate together. With that, I would like to uh, end here. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to uh, answer any questions or uh, discuss. If there is no time for a lot of questions, I can answer them uh, you know, via email or over the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to interact with everybody here and on the other campuses too. On that last model, um, are you prepared to also include um, changing climate and the weather and the availability of water in order to study different growth scenarios? And maybe uh, then even use that model to plan whether you, you really want to go with a particular uh, kind of fruit or given that we expect there's not enough water actually change to completely different um, uh, product. Uh, honestly, this is not part of this agenda, but it, it's an excellent idea because if you can incorporate that, then when we talk about a systems approach, mm -hmm. you can include that because you know the, the inputs due to cultivation, be it water or nutrients, right. it comes here. And that affects when and what grows here. So that could be part of, of you know a set of decision variables. Of course, we are talking about biological entities. Things are not very, you know, we are used to state space equations and all that, but sometimes you just need to go with a correlation curve because the phenomena are so complex that, you know, that's the best you can do. But it's definitely that could be uh, a possibility. Yeah, I just keep thinking. Is this on? Yeah. Um, about um, the whole monoculture versus polyculture uh, issue. I mean, these are obviously all for monocultures, and there's a lot of talk about if that's the best way for the environment and our, our ecolo ecological systems to, to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, any thought about doing, you know, diverse polyculture type of systems? Uh, it's, a, it's a good and valid comment, and what I would say is that you know, this approach is not really restricted to one system or the other. With this approach, you assume that you have your working environment, which is the plants, the layout of the plants, the, the geometrical information of the plants, and you are using that to design a machine. So if you know, half of the year that field has something and that half of the year something else, the approach could be applied. Having said that, if you are in an orchard, those trees stay there for a few decades. Also, if you are talking about you know, um, um, strawberries or other, uh, other uh, crops, then typically those crops will stay there for several years. So that's why I brought the paradigm of manufacturing. This research is, is, is very uh, uh, geared towards 
this intensive type of cultivation where you, you treat your system as a manufacturing environment. I'm not saying that that's the best approach, but I'm not saying also that this cannot be sustainable. Uh, you know, the challenge is how can you produce dramatically more crops with dramatically less input? And this is a challenge for agronomists and for engineers, but not only for those, you know, the, the human factor goes in there too. And the consumer and the workers. Uh, on the design side, are you guys talking at all about using reinforcement learning or evolutionary algorithms uh, in a more computationally intensive way to have, you know, some automated solutions to try out? Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent idea. Actually, uh, you can think of it as a, as a huge design space where, where do you start from? Uh, and this is not obviously a convex space. I'm not expecting to start with a set of parameters, which may also be continuous and discrete. You know, what is the length of this link, but also how many of those robots should I have, for example? So it's, it's a very complex problem. I mean, ideally, theoretically, you could set up such a problem and let it run and, and see what it comes up with. But honestly, I think that at some point we will need to make some decisions and then iterate on those. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering, you know, completely, but you know, this is this is what I'm thinking right now. Uh, my gut reaction. Thank you, um, Stavros. Thank you. you. This is a really interesting set of questions, and I'm curious if you mentioned the um, the Davis tomato harvesting mm -hmm. system. Can you say more about that and what was the breakthrough that le led to and how it works? Sure. Yeah. Definitely. This is uh, this was a milestone in in, in mechanized uh, harvesting. Uh, up to a point, all you know, tomatoes for ketchup, for example, were harvested manually. So we had thousands and thousands of workers laboring in the fields. Well, uh, there was a, a team of people at UC Davis, and that team included an engineer and a breeder. Uh, they worked together to produce a so-called square tomato. They, 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 they came up with a tomato that was thicker. It had thicker skin and it was also not as spherical, so it didn't roll as much. And then on the engineering side, they produced a system that could you know, uh, go down and then rip the plant and then take up the, 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 uh, the tomatoes without really destroying them. And, and that system was, uh, you know, was introduced, uh, and then it, it took about 10 to 20 years for that system to develop completely. Now they're doing also sorting, et cetera. So uh, the interesting thing with this story is that first of all, engineers and breeders came together and that's the only way we can work with these problems. The other, pro the other issue is that it really stole lots of jobs uh, from people who were laboring in the fields. But what is interesting is that that huge, you know, the, the, incre the efficiency increased 10 times. We could harvest 10 times as much crop as before the same amount of time, or, uh, but also the labor force decreased 10 times initially. But the, uh, the production increased dramatically because people now planted more tomatoes. And that meant that those tomatoes had to be processed in, in, in manufacturing plants, in you know, sorting processing plants. So the jobs really transferred from the field to those factories, to those processing plants. And Overall, and I can, I can uh, provide you with a link that did a study, overall, the number of jobs increased. There was a shift, though, from the field to facilities, to, um, to processing plants. I'm not really advocating or saying that any type of mechanization or automation will eventually provide more jobs. This is really something that would need to be studied. It's a very complex uh, uh, system and phenomenon, but you know, our gut reaction would be, oh, tomato harvester, no more jobs. Well, actually, you know, when you look at it, there were more jobs, just different types of jobs. So this is pretty much the story of the of the tomato harvester, and hopefully we can do the same for fresh market crops. That would be our dream. So um, I think one of the challenges is you have different crops and they ripen and have to be harvested very rapidly. And a human, maybe one day they can harvest apples and then a week later strawberries, whereas these would have to be very specialized. So how do you deal with that challenge? Uh, the machines would need to be very specialized for sure. 
Uh, I'm not saying that they, you know, if you build a machine to pick apples, it can also pick strawberries or, or even lemons. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a matter of cost. You know, depending on what the cost of the machine is, uh, the, war, the, the grower may adapt it or not. Let me give you an example. Right now, if you buy an orchard platform, it's about $50,000. What you get is increased efficiency. Well, the growers buy them, first of all, because of the increased efficiency, but also because it makes it easier for the workers to work. And now growers compete for labor. You know, uh, who is going to get more people to work on their fields? Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm getting the, exactly the, you know, the, uh, w w what you wanted to, uh, to know, but the machines will be definitely very, very specialized. People can gather anything, although you know, they will gather, let's say, uh, pears for a month, and then they may go north and gather apples uh, in Washington state. Uh, but also, there are cases like strawberry, which is almost an all year round uh, cultivation, where people just harvest strawberries. Uh, in principle, one could gather data and gather also size data. And then one could run such a system and let it harvest only apples bigger than, let's say, you know, 10 centimeters or less than 10 centimeters and compare. But what growers are doing now is because of the labor shortage, they typically pick only once, uh, although, you know, that brings down quality maybe a little bit. Uh, they, they may pick two times. I mean, they try to pick as little as possible. The other thing is from the breeding side, people are trying to get fruits to ripen more uniformly so that you don't really need to pick several times. Of course, the question of whether you can uh, strip harvest, strip pick, and then sort later, or if your machine could harvest selectively so you don't do that sorting afterwards, what is better, what is faster, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I would suspect that stripping everything in the field and sorting later would be faster. Because in the field, on the field, you would need to make a decision, how big is that apple? Should I go for it or not? Whereas once you have those apples, you know, you have a processing plant. There is a lot of food processing equipment, sorters, uh, you know. Yes, of course. So it's, it's, you know, it's Yes. Um, so that's a, that's a time lag again. Yeah, yeah. Different but it's, things, so. it's, it's, it's so difficult from a perception point of view to see objects, you know, apples, fruits in the canopy and detect them and let alone, you know, say then you know, it's so, so big, you know, 10 centimeters or 8 centimeters. It's much easier to do it in a, in a controlled environment. Uh, in yeah, a I have a question. Um, yes. Yeah, in the uh, mid-70s, so we, we had a drought in, uh, you know, California. And um, what, would, what did we learn from that drought? That, was, that would help us in this present uh, drought? Uh, how were we able to transcend uh, the 70s drought uh, and uh, maybe work our way out of this one? Hmm. Um, well, although water is not my field, so I'm not a, an irrigation expert, uh, uh, there are several ways that you can address this issue. From our side, from the ag engineering side, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, put as much water as the plant needs and not more. Agriculture takes about 70% of the fresh irrigated agriculture, which is California agriculture. We use 70% of the water for agricultural purposes. Uh, definitely by doing precision irrigation, by, by uh, using high technology to sense the water uh, status of the plant and the need of the plant, we can save 15, 20 percent of that. So that, that's an approach that's already very uh, uh, researched into. We are very active about that. But there are other ways which are not related to agriculture. For example, how many aquifers uh, do you build? What's their capacity? 
how do, do those interact with uh, you know uh, wildlife and so it's a very complex issue but the work the, the growers are very aware of the water issue because they pay for the water and they're doing their best to um, you know minimize the amount of water that they use and also the amount of work that they're doing now and you, you think their work behavior is uh, uh, you know affected is it lessened is it increased because of the water shortage well, they first of all they don't expand as much so they will not plant more because they cannot uh, and then they all have switched or to uh, precision irrigation. They're not really flooding anymore, or they are using less and less of that. So yeah, the growers are responding, definitely. But also the, the engineering community is responding. Um, that, that would be you know, one uh, response to your question. Is your research only concentrating on um, field? Um, Harvesting or also for harvesting under glass? Harvesting where? Under glass. Oh, okay. Uh, of course, there is there is that component too. Uh, the good thing with you know greenhouses is that the environment is much more controlled, and then you can even have different varieties. For example, I'll give you an example with strawberries. Um, in, in in some European countries, they have strawberries where the the fruit will drop on the side of of containers. Now, if all of your fruit drops on the right and left side of a container, you can build a robot. And there's actually a robot from Spain that's very simple. It has you know, nine arms on one side, nine on the other. It uses a camera to find the red strawberries and just lift them and grasp them, pick them. So the, the, the answer would be, under glass, you can structure your environment much better and you can have better solutions for harvesting rather than in the field. You also, lose, you also solve some perception issues because the uh, illumination is much more controlled. Uh, you are solving some dexterity and, and uh, uh, mechanics issues. But again, I'm not saying that all undercover crops are harvested uh, mechanically. No, there's a lot of labor going into that too. Any? more questions. Uh, again, as I said, I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. If there is any, anything else, you, know, you can email me. My contact information is, uh, is available. I would be happy to, to talk with anybody uh, about this, this research.